Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinarian media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. It is so embarrassing. Your friends come over to visit and your dog pees on the carpet when they reach down to greet it. You laugh while at the groomers as your dog trembles so severely they can barely hold its legs steady to trim its nails. At the veterinarians, you have to carry your 50-pound golden doodle through the door, whimpering all the way. What a baby. Or is it? And can you do anything about it? My guest is America's veterinarian, Dr. Marty Becker. We're going to discuss his recently released best-selling book, From Fearful to Fear Free. We'll be right back after the short break. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite for life. Pick up two tubes of Doggo Suds. Get the third tube free. Peppermint, tea tree, lavender, Doggo Sud shampoo. Made with all-natural coconut, jojoba, aloe. Great for healthy skin and soft, shiny coats. But no itchy, harsh chemicals. Lather up, rinse away. Try Doggo Suds. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Dr. Becker, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Your book, From Fearful to Fear Free, is fabulous. I know we have so much to talk about today. Oh, thank you so much for this. Uh, your introduction brings back memories, a lot of them painful, of passing by a pet store and watching pets in the window and the glass and grooming. And, you know, once you become aware, seeing what's what's being dragged through the front door, still wet from having urinated outside out of, out of being terrified. But Dr. Becker, when I was in veterinary school, they somewhat chided us for saying, oh, you know, this dog is scared or this dog is anxious. And it seems as though things have really changed. So is it correct? to be so anthropomorphic and say that dogs feel emotions like people do? Gosh, when you look back, uh, I graduated in 1980 from veterinary school. So, you know, coming up here on 40 years of practice pretty soon. And I was actually taught that pets did not feel pain. Animals did not feel pain like humans did. And then the caveat was if they did, it was good because they would be immobile. Yeah, they wouldn't chew out the stitches. They wouldn't step on the leg we just repaired. And you look back, and it's funny how people in authority have this mind control because we all dumbly believed it. I mean, how could we have? When you look back, I mean, they have the same neural pathways we do. And, of course, now the profession within the last decade has embraced multimodal pain management where it starts before surgery, during surgery, after surgery. So, you know, Bernadine, think back of all the dentals we did, digging that tooth out, that You know, it's almost like an iceberg with how much is below the surface tearing those gums to get that out or bone surgeries or pets that had been mauled, declaws done without uh, any kind of pain control and wondering why they don't eat the next day. So, but we've learned a lot, you know, we now have uh, an understanding that pets absolutely have emotions like we do, that they feel fear, anxiety, and stress. They feel happy and calm. They can be terrified of stuff, repulsed by certain things. You know, and it can be as simple as a candle that we think has a great fragrance, but is, you know, is making their life worse. And I think that we have to give veterinarians at least somewhat credit because MDs were no better, especially with pediatrics. We're talking about, you know, things that we're doing to pets that were painful. And we thought, oh, yeah, a little pain was good. But even things like human male babies being circumcised, you know, there wasn't pain control for them. So thankfully, all the way around, people are beginning to realize that pain is something that we have to stay on top of. But going to fear free. I know several years ago you started the Fear Free Initiative. Tell my listeners, please, what is it? Why did you start it? 
you know, it's funny, doing an interview with you is so different than doing, I was just in New York doing interviews with all sorts of magazines, and I realized they don't have the, the background in medicine and, and the history that we do. <laughs> you know, when you talk about, about pediatricians, that's such a great parallel, because when I was a kid, this started in 2009 when Karen Overall, a board of behaviors from Penn, very well known, very well respected within the veterinary profession, one of only 75 boarded veterinary behaviors in the world that are the American College of Veterinary Behavior. But she drew a parallel to the human health care system of the 50s and 60s. And she asked who in the room was a child in the 1950s and 60s. And I raised my hand along with a bunch of other people. And she said, do you remember a traumatic incident? that is still fresh in your mind. And I went right back, the old amygdala retrieved an issue of being on that metal table with the drawers on one side that kind of sloped up like a fainting couch that had butcher paper on it, had a step you would pull out to stand on to get up on it. And he told me to stand up on it, pull my britches down, pull my underwear down, he's going to give me a shot. And I, I leaned down, I looked back around, and here come this a glass syringe. I told you how long ago it was with a big honk and needle. It was filled with white fluid and came over and just kind of held me down with his forearm, one arm and jabbed me in the butt with it and injected it. And I started wailing, not just crying. It hurt so bad. It's like, you know, looking back, it's 50s area syrupy thick penicillin and a big bolus of it. And my mom stood up not to comfort me. She stood up and raised her hand above her head and goes, shut up, Marty. <laughs> she, she, she said, don't embarrass the doctor. And, and that's what it was. We were the dependent beings in human health care. We didn't go by free will to the dentist or the doctor. And we were manhandled, manipulated, threatened, and abused. My older sister, Cheryl, I remember her getting her ponytail pulled in the dentist's office to keep her mouth open. We thought that was so funny. She was so terrified. No. But, you know, we know how pediatricians have changed. And in so many ways, you know, pets are like one- or two-year-olds. They are taken against their will to the doctor that they... They can't understand why the procedure is being done. So those listeners out there that have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews, when they're really young, you can't explain why this blood draw or examining this ear is going to help them, nor do they have the anticipation or expectation of the relief of pain, even if it's moments away. So as adults, we know, adult humans, we know that, oh, this tooth hurts, but you know what, we're going to go to the dentist and they're going to pull it, they're going to fill the cavity, they're going to do something, or we have some kind of injury or wound or, or an achy hip and the doctor's going to put us on something. Well, pets don't have that. And so fear is caused by something. This is where Karen Overall explained it to us that day in 2009 in October. Fear is caused by something painful or something disturbing. So painful can be coming into the veterinary hospital, and unless they're coming in for routine health care, there's almost always pain. It's an abscess. They got mauled. They scratched their eye. Their ears like uh, a fire pit. Their gums are like a somebody put a flamethrower and burned across them. Even uh, having their, their temperature burned. taken is not a lot of fun. Right. They don't understand that's not one way. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> so they they associate the pain with us. So in their amygdala, I hurt and this person hurt me in this spot. And then disturbing, it can be the smell the sound of the clippers being put up on the table, the sight of the nail trimmers, the sight of a syringe, this, being on this place with a catheter placement. And again, go back to that one or two-year-old. They don't know why this benefits them. So, you know, I've been, I wanted to be a veterinarian from the time I was a, a little boy, about seven years old. And nobody gets in veterinary medicine to make life worse for animals. And I've never met a professional that, you know, I suppose somewhere in the globe there's some sadistic person that would want to dehorn cows or something, make them hurt. But I, I just can't even imagine it. And so we enter it because we love animals. We're compassionate. But fear-free is none of those. Fear-free is looking at the emotional well-being of animals. So you look at each animal. You can kind of get an overall look of certain species, and there's certain things that cause fear, anxiety, and stress. For example, like cats need a place to hide. The last thing they want to do is be out in the open around other animals they don't know. And then you look for the specific animal. What causes it fear, anxiety, and stress? You talk to the owner. He's okay until he goes up on the scale. He does pretty good, but when you put him up on the table, there's certain individuals in the practice that, that she doesn't like. And so now you start to remove or reduce the triggers for fear, anxiety, and stress. And if it arises, you have a multitude, a multimodal thing of starting at the living room to the exam room and back to the living room. We always serve to douse, you know, if someone's trying to light the fuse of fear, anxiety, and stress, we smother it out, and we keep it to where the pet doesn't have a full-blown panic attack. But sometimes, Dr. Becker, I think it's difficult for 
owners to realize, is this pet being fearful? So a pet comes in and it doesn't seem to be shaking or it's not peeing on itself or the cat's not, you know, reaching out and trying to swat at the veterinarian. What are some of the common signs that dogs in particular will exhibit when they're fearful? I love you. This is such a great interview. I'm not trying to make this. We've known each other a long time, but your answers are so well thought out. We didn't even, the profession didn't even know all the signs of fear, anxiety, and stress. The overt ones, the ones that most people would realize, if you've ever had a pet in a thunderstorm or the 4th of July, you know the trembling, you know the, the lip licking, you salivate, they pant, they shiver. Uh, you, in your intro, talk about shivering on that table. They seek a place to hide. They avert gaze. Their ears are pinned back. They have a furrowed brow. Like still remember, going back to Karen Overall, you know, this thing that's, that did this transformative event with me. And, and Bernadine, I don't know if you had a similar experience, but I had other board of behaviors talk to me about this before, Karen Overall, but it went in one ear and out the other. I thought, yeah, I see it, but it's collateral damage. Oh, they'll and get over it. It's not a big deal. Yeah, it's just a short amount of time. Right. Buck up, puppy. That's right. Get them in. Get them out. We're, all, we're late for another point. We've got to do surgeries. We've got to do this. Exactly right. Not realizing repeat severe psychological damage to these pets. And then, you know, she went on. For, but what, anyway, what happened is I was always thought the dog that came in and laid down. So new cats, we used to joke that they were effed coming to a veterinary hospital. I mean, not in a mean way, but like, we'd, oh, no, no, those poor cats effed. And by effed, we meant fight, flight, freeze, or fidget, and love the cats that froze. Just sat there. You'd do anything to it. It was like a stuffed animal, and we actually liked it. You know, you weren't going to get injured. You could do a full exam, right? not knowing that's what's called collapsing immobility, the worst. And the similar on the dog was the dog that comes in, lays down, and goes like it's going to sleep. I always thought before carrying overall that that was good. That dog was really relaxed and could just, you know, like nap. Well, there's a something called the defense cascade, and the first thing you see is alert, and that's that's fight or flight. So, you know, for us, it might be a gunshot or a scream. For them, it might be a cage door opening or uh, the arrival at the hospital. Alert, now it's fight or flight. And it goes through this defense cascade till you get to the very bottom. And it's collapsing immobility. And I'll give you some kind of some examples on the human side that are horrific. When you think of Syria now, and you're in an orange jumpsuit, and there's a film crew, and Jihadi John's behind you in the dialect, you know it's not going to have a good outcome. Why do you sit there and kneel and, and be beheaded? Why was that little boy in Syria sitting on the back of that ambulance caked in mud in that iconic image from that year? They think they're going to die. They've given up. I'm going to die. And whatever happens, happens. So that's some of the signs. And now the veterinary hospital, it's really interesting. Fear Free started out just the right thing to do. Look at physical and emotional well-being of animals. Make sure we take care of the, uh, the stuff that's painful and something's disturbing. But it became very quickly evident that it was better medicine. And that appeals to veterinarians. And so your temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, the vital signs we take were actually normal so we could detect things early on. You know, instead of 102.5 being stress, it might be the sign of a fever. If you have a racing heart, what we call tachycardia, it might be the result of a heart condition starting out, not just fear. And then the blood chemistries were more normal. These blood tests we take, instead of what we call a stress leukogram, where the spleen just squeezes out all this stuff, and so the red blood cells and the white blood cells are higher and the blood glucose is higher, hey, maybe this dog is a pre-diabetic or this cat. And then the physical exam, Bernadine, how many animals, it was limping at home, or they touched it and it screamed, it comes to the hospital, and you can spin the leg around the 360 degrees and not elicit a pain response because they're jacked up on adrenaline, and now you can reproduce it. They limped at home, they limp in the clinic, and we can pinpoint this, where the soft tissue damage was. So, and then the injuries dropped. This is one of the crazy things didn't expect. Now that we knew the science of fear, anxiety, and stress, and had a scale to measure it. We didn't get the wind up. If they start to be stressed, we just didn't add another tech. Oh, God, we need another tech. Oh, we need another tech. Now there's four people holding the dog down. The pile on. Now yes. we pile on. Now we douse it down and we, we stop what we're doing. We retreat. We give them something orally and let it work. We go straight to sedation. So the injury rates are, have plummeted. I think, and, and I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but I have a, in northern Idaho, we have members of the family that are in the logging industry. And in Idaho, logging and roofers have the highest workers' compensation rate. And then miners are number, are number two. 
I've asked at a veterinary convention with 3,000 people in the room, how many of you have been bitten or scratched in the last year? And 3,000 people raised their hand, maybe 2,999, and one person was on their phone. And then how many of you expect to be bitten or scratched in the next year? And 2,999 raised their hands again. What other profession can anyone think of that has a 100% injury rate every year? And it's because of fear-based aggression. There's some pets that are so psychologically traumatized that they're on the attack when they come in, but they're just fighting for their life. I think you're exactly right. And one of the things that, you know, decreasing all of this fear, anxiety, and stress is so important. But, oh, thank you again for bringing Fear Free to the veterinary profession, to pet owners also. But what I've been enjoying so much about incorporating Fear Free into my practice is that as I walk through the door, we can talk about bringing in my little tisket a tasket basket with goodies. I call it bribes. You know, I'm, I'm honest with them. And I'm trying to get the pet to relax, enjoy me. And what is so, so gratifying is that the pet owner goes, wow, my pet liked coming here today. You are now its favorite friend. They're less resistant to bringing their pet into the future. So I'm finding these People are bringing their animals in more frequently, so I'm able to do better proactive care because it's not like, oh, my pet hates going to the vet. Now it's like, hey, it kind of likes going through the door. Where's the peanut butter? It wants its peanut butter. It really has helped that human-animal bond, but much more so the human-human bond. I'm sitting here smiling so wide I could eat a banana sideways here to say (laughs) that. I've been in in shopping centers. And I encourage veterinarians to watch this sometime. If you can find one in your area where there's a veterinary hospital and a pet store, watch the pets going into the pet store. They will drag the owner in like they're they're going from Fairbanks to Nome to deliver vaccine, you know, during the diphtheria crisis back in the day. They will, because they get to, they sniff that outer vertical surface, it's happy pee-pee. They go inside to get to pee-pee on this, and then they, they go and they get a treat and a toy, and everybody's happy, the pets are happy, the people are happy. And then you see the veterinary hospital, and now instead of the, the dog dragging the owner in, the owner's trying to drag the dog in. So what has happened in there? It's been fear, anxiety, and stress. It's been something painful or something disturbing. So you change the narrative. You know, we, we have them come in hungry and fear-free, and we have incredible food rewards. And you talk about bribes, you know. It's really funny. I do these symposia, and I'll go in the head of the symposia. So it'll be 200 veterinarians and veterinary nurses there. And I take about four or five dollars worth of change. It's pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters. Towards the end of the day, I go, oh, hey, by the way, I got something for you. And I hold up uh, like five five dollar bills because I had five pennies earlier. And I say, if anybody can look down within 15 seconds, find a penny on the floor and hold it up. I'll give you five bucks. And everybody all of a sudden looks around and, oh, yeah, because they'd seen it before. So they hold it up real proud and I go around and give each of them five bucks. And I said, how much would I had to give out if I said, I'll give you five dollars for a quarter on the floor? They're all gone. Everybody had picked up the silver, but nobody had picked up the penny. At least some. So you, the point is, if I had a piece of their regular dog food, which is a penny, it's not enough to get me to come off the spot. But if I've got, you know, turkey hot dogs and peanut butter Captain Crunch, and you talked about peanut butter, easy cheese. I was at a veterinary hospital. It's Fear Free in Spokane, Washington, recently, Indian Trail Veterinary Hospital. The receptionists all had the little Fear Free treat bags, so they'd come around the corner and meet the pet, avert a gaze, turn sideways, Hansel and Gretel them up to say hi. Then they'd check them in. Then when they went to be weighed, there's a scrubbable surface on the wall, and they'd put a smiley face in Easy Cheese, depending on how high the pet was. As the pet's licking a smiley face off the wall, it's being weighed. That's Fear Free Hospital. And that's called Sneaky and a great idea. And another great idea is we're going to take a short break, have our commercial break, and we'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Listeners, I'd love to introduce you to PetPlate.com. They deliver freshly cooked human-grade dog food right to your door. I've been feeding Pet Plate to my pup for the last two weeks, and it's perfect for my picky pup and perfect for me since I'm so busy. So if you want something super healthy, really tasty, and ready to serve, go to PetPlate.com forward slash spot to get 30% off your first box. P-E-T-P-L-A-T-E dot com. 
Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in, and we'll see you now. Well, I'm having the pleasure of speaking with America's veterinarian, Dr. Marty Becker. Your stories are fabulous, and the story right now is about fearful to fear-free. So, Dr. Becker, question for you. Do you really think there are some breeds that are maybe more prone to being fearful than others? Oh, yeah. But you know what I think is, you know, it's really funny. You mentioned a pit bull, and people say they get a bad rap. I you know, love the website, Bad Rap for Pit Bulls. What I found out, it started out people saying, well, cats are really scared to go to the veterinarian. It's mostly cats, right? And the cats aren't coming in like they used to. Cat visits are down. It's across the board. Once you get into it, it is across the board. Every animal has some degrees of fear, anxiety, and stress. For listeners out there, probably the most overt is 4th of July or thunderstorms when they see their pet doing the St. Vitus dance. It's almost like it's an epileptic in convulsions. It's panning, it's salivating, it's shivering, it's hiding, it's trying to get into the bathtub or someplace to get rid of the static electricity. Others, it's just episodic, like going out to a, on a walk, and there's a dog that they always meet and has you know some kind of uh, leash aggression that you see. Or it's going to uh, grooming episodically. For the worst affected, it's, it's separation anxiety. They literally think they're going to die when you walk out that door. It's unlike this, like a child that leaves, you know, that's lost at the mall or goes to a fair and is separated from its mother. It's that kind of a panic every single day. And I used to do that as a kid all the time, and it's such that horrid feeling. People don't realize that it truly is that panic attack, isn't it? Yeah, and that, once you know the signs of fear, anxiety, and stress, that's one of the things that's in the book. You know, we talk about, we let you see it. We let you inside their world so that you see for dogs, and you know the common triggers, and you know there's things to do. You know, like for, for thunderstorms, let's just tackle that. One of the things we talk about in the book are compression garments. Temple Grandin, who, who we both know, is probably of the 227 people on Fear Free. She's, and you know, when when say Fear Free, I'm kind of the face of it, but it's we, not me. You're a member of it, and you're one of 227 people, Bernadine, that's on this Fear Free Advisory Group. We have 59 of the 75 Board of Behaviorists. We have the Head of Animal Cognition at Duke, the Head of Animal Cognition at Barnard, uh, Alexander Horowitz that wrote the number one New York Times bestseller, Inside of a Dog, the Head of Ethology at MIT. We have, uh, you know, our, our Chief Medical Officer is, we both know, Dr. Steve Bettinger is the most iconic veterinarian in the world. And then we have Tony Buffington, who heads environmental enrichment. That's another big piece, too, is, you know, enriching pets live. But going, going back to, to Temple Grandin, she writes in her book, Animals in Translation, in the Claire Danes movie, that she needed compression to relax in college. So it's a tight squeeze. For, for those of us that don't, uh, aren't autistic, it's a hug when you lose a family member or a pet. It's swaddling a baby. So a thunder shirt works about 70% of the time. And then when it doesn't work, there's some what we call anxiolytics. When you think of Valium or Xanax, things like that, that can really help a pet. There's a new FDA-approved product called Celio that's amazing for noise phobias. So it is, and I have six dogs, and two of them have really bad noise phobias, and it's so bad that it's just a buzzer in the kitchen. One buzzer goes off, and there they start shaking. Well, this is really interesting. If a baby's crying, and I was on a plane a few days ago, and a baby walks on and it's crying, and everybody Sighs. gets off the prayer. When I would say the, the mobile phone prayer, everybody's heads are bowed, looking at their phones, you know, and as you walk onto the plane, they all looked up at the baby, and you think, oh, it's in distress. What is it? Gas? Is it hungry? Is it tired? Does it need its diaper changed? And we all want to fix it. What could it be? I hope she gets to calm down. Well, these pets are crying. It's just not a human. And so you have to know the signs of what is distressing your pet and know that we now help. We can help. And so, you know, you'd ask really about some breeds. There's some really reactive breeds. When you think of, uh, you know, border collies or other breeds that are really reactive and been traumatized, but it's more the history. Like there's a something called the amygdala that's deep in the brain. It's about the size of an almond. I don't know how it can store all the bad stuff, but it remembers my parents arguing about getting a divorce when I was hiding in my room trembling. It it remembers a bad breakup with a girlfriend. It remembers my granddaughter getting RSV virus and my sitting there with the foot on the clutch and the foot on the brake crying, with not even shutting the truck off, worrying she was going to pass on. 
It remembers the, the death of all my pets. It remembers uh, hitting a deer front on, you know, a couple of years ago on Thanksgiving to come out of there and the airbags deployed. So for these dogs and, and cats, that amygdala is stuffed full of stuff that happened. And it's up to us. We're going back to that one or two-year-old child that's crying. They can't tell us what happened. And this one thing Temple Grandin said, you, you can't parse out what happened in the hospital. Was it a botched catheter placement and the sound of the clippers now freaks them out? Were their nails trimmed too short? Was it a painful anal gland expression? Was it just that I had an injury and was touched in here? We don't know. So that's why a lot of times at a veterinary practice, you will be prescribed something, uh, gabapentin for cats or trazodone for them to, I guess, I don't know, maybe you could help me describe it, but it's like chemical crutches that allows them to have as good of experience as the pet that's never had trauma, the new puppy. And using a lot of nutraceuticals, uh, what we call chill pills, compression garments, and then, if not, go into an FDA-approved product. I agree with you, Dr. Becker. So many people, however, seem to be very adverse. They're concerned with using medications. Like, look, the pet's not going to know how to open up that bottle to get to this medication. This is not something that they're going to be addicted to. This is something that allows them just to take that breath and relax. They're calmer and by the way, you're calmer. And so many times and you're talking about what's happened in their past, people these days are so wonderful for adopting these rescue dogs. And they come with baggage and baggage that we have no idea why these animals got rehomed. Did they run away? Were they rehomed? Somebody threw up their hands and said, I can't do anything about this. So I love it when people are willing to take on that challenge and going, there are things that you can do there's just slow, easy ways. Medication oftentimes will just allow them to hear, listen, and feel your love. So don't be afraid of those medications. And sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error. You start one medication, it doesn't work for that particular pet. Just as though you have a person who has their own behavioral or mental issues. Sometimes it's a trial and error. You need to be cognizant you don't always get it right the first time, but you have to be patient. All I can say is amen. You know, And you'll have people, for the listeners out there, some of you may think, and this is what we'll hear in the veterinary hospital, Doc Blank never did this to trim the dog's nails. And I took the dog, or I've had dogs for 30 years, and I've never done this to have a dog's nails trimmed or their anal glands expressed or their ears checked. Well, you know what? We don't do convenience euthanasia anymore where people just bring a dog in and and pay you to euthanize it. We don't crop ears anymore. We're not going to not give a pet pain medication either. So it's for your pet safety. It's for our safety. And more importantly, it's just the right thing to do. That Pilotex restraint where that dog's back there and it thinks it's going to die and it, its anal glands are expressed. It urinates, it poops, it's shivering, it's salivating, it's huffing and puffing. No more. That's just no more Pilotex restraint, rodeo, judo, throw. And now that we know, you know, about thinking about physical and emotional well-being, you know, our slogan, I, I happen to love the slogan, taking the pet out of petrified. When you described that earlier where the pet owner, they actually want to come in. The dogs want to come in. And before Fear Free, I was practicing at North Idaho Animal Hospital in Sandpoint, Idaho, up in the Panhandle. This never happened where the dogs would drag them in. Now we have a walking trail that goes right by a community walking trail. And the people that are clients, the pets try to drag them into the hospital because they think it's a place Ooh, where a they're going to be bribed. And there's an elementary school close by, and the, you know they'll have the pets in the car to go by to pick the kids up from elementary school, and the pets are scratching at the window. Oh, my God, there it is. <laughs> Don't go by. That's where all the good stuff happens in there. And, you know, it's not just food either. One of the things we've learned about, if I don't have to get on the scale or have my temperature taken, that's positive. If I don't have to, uh, if I have my choice of where I'm examined, it's a positive. If I have, we find out what method of gentle control, what we used to call restraint works better, that's a positive. Physical touch, we do a lot of stuff with physical touch. We know now where dogs and cats like to be touched, and so we use things like a, a Kong Zoom groom, which for women, it always, the best way to describe it is when somebody washes your hair, oh, and they have those fingers heaven. in there, and these pets yes. are like, oh, God, this feels good. Heaven. And so it just makes me smile. It makes me smile to think 
you know, we're only two years old. We started uh, the online education program for veterinarians and veterinary nurses in April of 2016, and we're over 30,000 individuals that have been trained, and there's a there's a bunch of others joining. There's a one group of 26,000 going to join. So probably by next year, next April, three years after launch, there'll be 75 to 100,000 veterinary healthcare professionals that really put the emotional well-being of dogs and cats first. And the neat thing too, you know, it started out the right thing to do. Then we find out about medicine. We find out about safety. Then we find out, you know, it makes practice fun again. But now we realize they can't have a great experience in the in the hospital and have a horrible life at home or at the groomer or at boarding or at uh, the daycare. So now it's expanded to where uh, through fearfreehappyhomes.com, it's really a place where people will look to find a fear-free veterinary healthcare professional. And now there's actually certified practices too that have certified fear-free individuals inside. They can find fear-free trainer. Our fear-free shelter task force is formed. By the end of the year, they'll be able to adopt a pet at a fear-free shelter. It'll live in a fear-free happy home. It'll go to a fear-free veterinary and be referred to a fear-free trainer. Next year's grooming and daycare. But I'm so proud of our profession. We're reclaiming our authority. The pet store employee that upsells people on high-priced food and they spend their pet health care dollars on something that does 100% no benefit above a moderately priced food. It's all upsold and declines to take it into the veterinarian because it's so painful to go in. But as the veterinary health care professionals now, we're taking that pet's emotional well-being and putting bubble wrap around it. Every place, that whole ecosystem of that pet, we're going to make sure that that pet has a happy, healthy, full life. Happy is fear-free, healthy is a state-of-the-art veterinarian, and full is enrichment. And that's another big piece. You know, pets aren't born to be retired. They have, you know, cats like to hunt, cats like to hide, cats like to scratch, cats like to climb. We have to provide those for dogs. They used to actually have to hunt for supper. <laughs> so we've got we've to recreate that in a, in a clever way in the home with using food dispensing devices and other exercises. Other generations, Bernadine, will look and they'll think, they'll look back at the way we used to practice veterinary medicine. It'll seem so archaic and so barbaric. And pet owners, right from the time they adopt that pet at a shelter, will know that they have an obligation, just like they would a two-legged child. Now they got a four-legged child, happy, healthy, full life, working in concert with their veterinarian and fear-free. And Dr. Becker, you're just saying it right now, which is like, oh, yes, things that are barbaric, where there are still behaviorists, if you want to call them that, people on TV without a lot of formal background who've become very well known in the animal field going, oh, yes, you need to be the alpha in that pack. You need to be the dominant one. You need to show who is boss and finding that's really not the way to go and that our pet parents And I love the fact that you have this huge section from fearful to fear free on socialization, why getting these babies as babies, and you can even get them socialized when they're older, but that critical time when they're youngsters and they're just so malleable. In the few minutes that we have left, could you touch a little bit about socialization and why it's so important to have this emotionally secure pup, then allow it to become that emotionally secure adult? And I'll tell you what. If we can get pets to like to go to the veterinarian, what was formerly the hell hall, the torture chamber, trust me, you can take any adult or any dog and get them to where they're better socialized. And this is on a walk. This is going to the dog park. This is going to meet some friend on the patio at Starbucks. But, you know, they're social animals and they want to be social. What happens sometimes is we ignore the things that are causing stress in them. And so then the outcome is poor. So... They're terrified of car noise, and we go to a place where there's car noise nearby and so I want them to relax. So with, you know, with younger pets, if you're adopting them or, or a young adult that you got at the shelter, you want to take them to the places that typically cause, can cause stress in a dog. So it's around strange things. It's all age groups. It's young, it's middle-aged, it's old in wheelchairs. If you're going to be around tractors or ATVs or motorcycles or things, you make put positive associations with those things. You let them, you give uh, some friends some treats and have them meet you on the street, have them meet you at different places where 
you intersect around a building on a sidewalk, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, there's there's a treat here! Wow! And pretty soon they get to thinking, you know, I go out in the environment, it's just like magic. These treats rain from the sky. I don't even have to do anything. And here they come down, and I'm, you know, in the veterinary hospital, we call it putting the treat into treatment. But it's so that's the neat thing about these things. Luckily, you know, food is such a motivator for dogs. And this is one thing when you think about cats too, you know, from fearful to fear free is about dogs. And we'll, we'll be working on one sometime about cats. But uh, Alana Rodan, who you and I both know is a very well-known feline specialist, she told me early on in this fear free thing that 85% of cats in her practice took treats. And I thought, and I think she's on some catnip or something. There ain't no way you can get 85% of cats to take treats when we're about 20% of cats, one out of five would take a treat. But lo and behold, by reducing the fear, anxiety, and stress triggers for those cats and creating a different environment and having incredible food rewards, it's amazing. We're probably up near that. In some of the stuff we have for cats, like when I practice, I'll have anchovy paste, deli turkey, shrimp, albacore, tuna, peanut butter, easy cheese, uh, bonita fish flakes, and my favorite one, and I don't know if you've tried this yet, Bernadine, is whipped cream and putting it in a, the old ice cream cones like your mom used to give you that tastes like eating yellow styrofoam. Mm-hmm. You know, put whipped cream in there, and these cats will lick that whipped cream, and their eyes are closed. It's just like they're nursing their mother, this look they have. <laughs> and, and there's been some really well-known veterinarians. Green all is something else we use. And this one veterinarian that's very well-known, a dermatologist, said, oh, this is another one of Becker's crazy things, you know, whipped cream, green olives. And he's now the whipped cream, green olive king of dermatology. <laughs> And it's just amazing to see them happy and calm, distracted, and we change our needles out. You know, they don't see the needle coming. There's pheromones in the air. There's calming music playing, and you're done, and they go, aren't you going to vaccinate it? I did. You did? (laughs) They can't even believe you've done it. What a great feeling. Dr. Becker, this has been a great interview, and I know we could go on for many, many more minutes and hours because you just have such great stories, wonderful ways to make our pets feel less fearful, less anxious, less stressed, and that's what we want for our our dogs and cats. So thank you very much for bringing forth this fear-free initiative. Strongly recommend that everyone get your book, From Fearful to Fear-Free, It is spectacular. If you have any questions that you'd like us to address on the show, please direct them to the Pet Doctor at PetLifeRadio.com. You can also go to my Facebook page, Dr. Cruz, the letter N, Pets, so Dr. Cruz and Pets, and you can get some more information there. So thank you so much for listening. Please tune in again next week. We'll give you more information on how to make you that best possible pet owner. Take care. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.